I was awarded the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation's Artist Advancement Grant last year by proposing to spend unhurried weeks buried in the landscape of my childhood. I was born in England and travelled extensively as a child, living in both India and Pakistan. I came to the US when I was 19, but it is still England and my roots there that call out to my artistic soul. I wanted to go back for six weeks in March to spend the time necessary to search out, study and catch the spirit of exceptional trees in that enduring landscape. I am passionate about trees, especially ancient solitary survivors. They are a metaphor for all I hold dear, family, generosity, connections, resilience, shelter and wisdom. Their gnarly bark and peculiar anatomy also awaken in me a compulsion to draw and at the same time being present with them revives and nourishes me. I promise to take full advantage of the opportunity by embracing risks, working much larger and focusing on sharing the journey as well as thoughts on the climate crisis. However, because I was impatient to have new work for this impact show that was supposed to be back in April, instead of waiting to travel in March, my husband and I actually went for a pre-trip to England for two weeks after Thanksgiving. We chose to stay in the Peak District after researching famous trees in advance. This is an area in the middle of the country famous for unspoiled beauty. It was freezing cold in December and the morning fog was always as thick as soup. But slowly, as the fog lifted, each place revealed incomparable trees. I was wrapped in nostalgia. Do I love it more because I left when I was so young? Who knows? Anyway, I found one tree with a great arm pointing skyward and another with a huge heart-shaped hole in the trunk. There were, of course, more than those two, but they inspired the first major works on my return. I felt a mixture of exuberant and terrified, but also unconstrained. The grant had validated exploration and bravery. My heart was in my mouth a lot, as ink is unforgiving. But sometimes discomfort and angst bring forth gratifying steps forward and I was so pleased with the results. So even before the much anticipated main trip, I had already experimented with jumping down the rabbit hole. I had chosen March for the immersive trip because there would still be no leaves on the trees, but spring with warmer and longer days would be imminent. We looked forward to staying in five different locations. The first was a quick trip to Chester for family graves. And then there was to be 10 days right inside a National Trust property, famous for its trees. Croft Castle was an enormous and glorious mixture of parkland, fields and woods with a high promontory that was the site of an Iron Age fort. There were thousands of trees, some extraordinary, and the views of the landscape were staggering. We were staying in a small cottage inside the walled garden. It was perfection. With a bursting heart and determined not to waste a moment, I started to fill my sketchbooks and return time after time to closely observe chosen trees. I had no idea where the journey would take me, but I hoped the drawings would remind myself and others of the vital role these ancient survivors play in our world. While I was drawing, I tried to quiet my mind and really focus. I agree with Herman Hesse, who calls trees the most penetrating preachers. I got lost in the texture of the bark the mysterious holes to the inner core and the sweep of the branches above. 
I imagine the rings on the trunk marking each passing year and the mysterious lower world beneath the ground. The trees are themselves giant ecosystems supporting teeming wildlife in the branches and bark and also underground. They are a haven for birds, lichens and invertebrates and at the same time feed us and clean our air. Scientists have also proved the fungal or mycorrhizal network underground transports vital nutrients as well as information via the network they name the wood wide web. A tree can only be as strong as the forest or friends that surround it. Therefore a standalone tree will not live as long as one protected by its family in a woodland. There is little forest left in England but luckily the great houses and castles owned by the gentry have beautiful gardens and acres of parkland. Much of these are far too expensive to keep up so have been sold to the National Trust and are now open to the public to wander and enjoy. What a treat for city dwellers. The ancient trees, some a thousand years old, have often survived because of pollarding. The trees were pruned through the ages by those who lived in prior centuries, using the wood to build their houses, cathedrals and ships, and for warmth and cooking fires. The pollarding resulted in short squat trees with wide trunks that are very resilient and sometimes being hot and sometimes being hollow are still very much alive. They are a part of history and the idealized version of the landscape I left behind when I came to the US. Conservation of these trees has little chance of success without understanding of excellent science. In England, this is now a priority. Scientists are studying soil health and diversity of age and tree species, so hopefully they will survive the intense storms on our warming planet and be contributing for years to come. In the second week of March, our trip was interrupted. The news was all about the virus and with travel shutting down worldwide, we had to cancel our next bookings and return home three weeks early. It was on the one hand so disappointing, but on the other, we were grateful for the time we had at Croft and we had a lovely home and studio in which to isolate. The suitcases were full of inspiration in the form of sketches and backup photographs. I even had a supply of 44 by 30 paper to start on. I was able to go straight into uninterrupted work mode, all fired up with the intention of enlarging the sketches onto good paper. I selected my favourites, the ones that had called to me, and I will tell you a little about each one. The first was an ancient oak I had spied on the edge of the forest from across a couple of fields. The March sun was making it a luminous green and I could see the branches were a perfect arc against the darker pines behind. Curious, I strode towards it and found the trunk was like a crouching animal in its mossy cage. It took weeks of patient rendering with my confidence going through various highs and lows. I called it Continuum as I visualized its roots completing the arc underground. The next I attempted was an enormous and almost rectangular shaped oak tree with a nine or ten foot trunk. Five or six people could have hidden inside and the trunk was covered in that same bright green moss. I had not used coloured ink on major works before drawing these large pieces, but I decided the luminous moss was the main attraction for both and I would try it. I have since attempted another oak, called Open to Alternatives, using even more colour. This large chestnut tree was one of the Spanish chestnuts captured from on board the Armada and taken to plant at Croft Castle in 1588. They were planted in the shape of Sir Francis Drake's formal battle plan, 
the chestnuts representing the Spanish and the oaks the English. The piece was done with sumi and walnut ink on Arches hot press. All the chestnut trees at Croft Castle are formidable, immense, fractured and bristle with warts and protrusions. Trunks are often stripped of bark. They swirl and corkscrew upward into oblivion. No one has tidied around them. Random dead branches lie strewn at their feet, enriching the soil as they decay. I fell under this one's spell, attracted by the feeling of danger and unexpected menace. The hot press allowed for layering ink, building rich tone over the weeks. I would think I've ruined it and put it aside, and then later I would look again and the hot press would allow another layer which rescued it time and again, making it more sinister and mysterious. The other piece I would like to talk about is one I started plain air. I can no longer hold a large backboard for a long time. It makes my arm ache. So this piece, and also family ties, were originally only 15 inches high. I brought the fin finished drawings back in my suitcase and then added on another 10 inches or so. I have learned to join two pieces of paper by sanding a strip at the meeting point and applying matte medium to glue them together. I weight them down and allow them to dry and become one. In this case, I covered the seam afterwards by gluing on small pieces of paper with a continuation of the foot of the tree. The last part of the piece was to draw roots below the ground. I then sewed on an etching, printed on tissue paper, so the roots are visible through a kind of veil. The etching includes several of my ancestors, their gravestones and old family letters. It's a photopolymer print, made from a transparency in a light box. My husband is luckily good at all things technical. We're a good team. So he helped me bring all the elements together on a transparency so I could make the plate. This highly personal piece in memory of my family, I call in memoriam. One of the hardest things for an artist is to make those first marks on the page. As 44 inch paper is so expensive, I usually sketch the piece on rough paper first and make sure it works. I hang it with magnets and ponder a while adjusting composition and size. I was meticulous with the four large pieces in the show, tracing the rough drawing and transferring an impression onto good paper as a starting point. However, as I did with the chestnut, sometimes I avoid controlling what happens and go right in with either ink-tense pencils or diluted ink onto good paper. I spray the wet ink with water and let effects appear. If I correct initial lines later, having the ghost there is sometimes interesting in an image and makes it more alive. That diluted ink, a bamboo pen, salt and the spray bottle are some of my greatest secrets. Also a new patience in considering a piece, letting it hang for a while and just looking at it. Drawing every single day, in other words the 10,000 hours of practice, and always being open to learning something new keeps my artistic life eternally exhilarating. I will close with my diary entry from March 19th, which captures the emotion of that frantic time. And so we returned early. I wept as I had a final walk in the woods above the cottage. It looked particularly glorious with the trees set off by evening light and the valley rolling away below. We drove away and were sucked back into the frenzy of uncertainty and preparation for the unknown. I know I have so much to be thankful for. We are safely back in the four walls of our Kittery home and studio. The memories will always be with us. Larry documented it all so beautifully and with humour too, and the work from the experience can now begin in earnest. 
It was the deep immersion I had craved, the time to form a relationship with the trees and interact again and again to capture their essence. The light was ever-changing. One minute the trees were dark and menacing. The next they were caught in a beam of sunlight and tipped in gold. I would come upon a tree I thought I knew, but from a different direction, and discover it anew. The clouds raced and scudded, blown by a fierce wind, allowing those bursts of golden light to pattern the land. I soaked it up, the landscape of my youth, and relished that unspoiled piece of the natural world. It was just as it had been through hundreds of years of history. I'm so happy it is cherished and looked after still. The spring burst out around us, with birds in constant song and the flower beds full of yellows, mauves, blues and daffodils, crocuses and primroses. My heart is full. We will get through this nightmare and the beautiful world will be waiting. Thank you.